Thank you, Lynn. Well, welcome to the first FST AUP web seminar of 2010. And the title today is How to Combat Digital Piracy on a Budget. This is an extremely topical subject for all of us, both journal and book publishers worried about the revenue we are or may be losing from illicit digital copies of our products. Estimating how much we are losing to piracy is very hard. The figures are ranging in recent days from $3 billion lost to online book piracy, as reported in Publishers Weekly on the 14th of January, to the estimate perhaps more realistic of our colleagues on the FSB Education Committee uh, Professor Al Greco of Fordham University, who estimates with a lot of ifs and however that it may be a range of 30 to 45 million dollars uh, for 2009 across uh, all academic uh, publications. You may hear some other figures today, but we can all tell that this is a new subject and we are still finding our way. So my name is Charles Watkinson. I'm director of Purdue University Press in Indiana and I'll be moderating this event. The web seminar has been organized by Alison Maurer, Scholar of Communications Library at the University of Utah, and we have three great speakers. The first speaker will be Ed McCoy, Executive Director for Digital, Environmental, and Accessibility Affairs at the Association of American Publishers. He will introduce some of the issues. The second speaker is Dr. Alicia Wise, Chief Executive of the Publishers Licensing Society in the UK, who will talk about some, and one in particular, of the industry solutions to dealing with the problem of digital piracy collaboratively. And the third and final speaker is Daphne Ireland, Director of Intellectual Property and Documentary Publishing at Princeton University Press. She will talk from the perspective of an academic publisher who has been particularly active in this area. Each speaker will speak for about 15 to 20 minutes. We will have time for a couple of specific questions after each presentation, but we will leave most discussion to the end. Before we start the presentation, I would like to share a few bits of logistical information. Firstly, this seminar is being recorded. All registrants will receive a link to the recording after the event so you can review the material covered at your leisure. Secondly, after the event, you will receive an online feedback survey. Please do complete that so we can improve future web seminars. Thirdly, we invite you to ask questions. In fact, we very much encourage you to do so. And please ask them at any time using the chat function, which you'll see towards the bottom right of your screen. You can find this instant messaging feature just down there at the bottom right, and all questions that you ask through it will be channeled to me as moderator, and I will ask them of the speakers. You may also have the speakers asking questions of each other on the phone lines, but because we have so many people on the call, we've muted the telephone lines of all the participants so that no background noise disturbs uh, all of us. So if you hear heavy banging or, or, or breathing, heavy breathing, it's one of the other presenters who is the brain. If you have technical difficulties at any time, please press star zero on your phone to talk to the operator. I hope you enjoyed this first seminar. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague, um, Ed McCoy, and ask him uh, to start the um, seminar. So you'll now see a little bit of sharing screen going on, and then Ed will start. Over to you, Ed. Okay. Thank you, Charles. Okay. So I've been asked to start this off by uh, giving an overview of the piracy landscape uh, as AAP has observed it and has been reported uh, by other people. Um, and I know that Alicia has some data uh, in that area as well. So my uh, report won't be comprehensive, but it will give you some of the uh, snapshots uh, that, that we've been able to gather. And I'll also touch on some legal points uh, in the area of uh, enforcement uh, and legislation. And thirdly, initiatives.
initiatives by the Association of American Publishers to help coordinate efforts among publishers to combat this problem. So I thought I would start off by uh, talking about a report that uh, Charles referenced in his introductory remarks, which was developed independently by an online monitoring vendor called the Trigger, which documented 9 million illegal downloads of copyright protected books in the last quarter of 2009. The contributor took 913 popular book titles across uh, various categories, as you can see in the last bullet of this slide, uh, business, professional, technical, science, health, fiction, and reference were all included. And based on four uh, websites which accounted for uh, a, a significant uh, portion of files that are made available, that also lists how many times available titles have been downloaded by users of the site. They uh, estimated that um, 9 million illegal downloaded copies had uh, been made uh, of these 913 popular titles. So on average, about 10,000 downloads per track title. AAP has an online piracy working group consisting of more than 25 publishers of various sizes. So we have some of the largest trade, uh, educational, and professional publishers in our membership. Uh, we also have university presses, uh, some publishers of journals, uh, monographs, and, and other uh, academic and professional materials. And periodically, since 2002, uh, our group has conducted what I refer to as snapshot monitoring. So uh, some monitoring for limited periods of time to try to get a sense of the nature and scope of the problem of online piracy of, of books and other literary works. And so what we mean by this is digital versions of uh, books that um, uh, may have originated as printed books that were scanned uh, or electronic books or, or other products uh, that may have had uh, technical security hacked off of them, uh, or even uh, files in the production workflow that have leaked out in some way. And the most recent round of monitoring that we did was in 2008 with the help of the law firm Covington & Burling, which has a monitoring service. And 15 members of our working group participated and had cut into search for five months continuously for a uh, list of titles provided by the publisher or all titles that Covington uh, was able to assemble by looking at uh, retail sites like Amazon.com. And they were primarily looking for books, uh, but they also looked for uh, audio books and some other content. The uh, service was checked, so uh, in, in a given month, they would eventually stop uh, working on these uh, uh, findings of infringement and efforts to take them down because we wanted to uh, contain the, the billing. The, uh, a key feature of the service provided by Covington was not only to find the infringements, but also to make efforts to get uh, the files taken down by online service providers. And so, Around the world, uh, countries have their own laws uh, that uh, will often provide for some kind of notice and takedown procedure. So this slide shows uh, some information about the U.S. implementation of that, which is Section 512 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And basically, it provides a safe harbor for search engines as well as providers of server space. So, for example, if I subscribe to the Internet through Comcast and I get some website service space through them, um, to block access to infringements or, or remove them from the Internet uh, when they get a valid takedown notice from the copyright holder. The overall results of the 2008 scan were uh, the detection of approximately 16,000 infringements of the 15 publishers works, and Covington was able to get about 85% of those removed or blocked. This pie chart shows 
uh, one category of uh, sites where we find many book infringements, which are referred to as one-click hosting providers. And you'll see that RapidShare is the dom was the dominant one-click hosting provider at that time, and it continues to be to this day. Uh, a one-click host provides server space to people who use the service, but you don't actually search for the infringements on that site. Instead, uh, the links can be found elsewhere through other search engines or people posting the links on their own uh, websites. Another category are torrent sites, which are basically search engines to find files using peer-to-peer -peer software uh, called the BitTorrent. Uh, and then there's a third category of sites, for which I don't have a pie chart, which are sites that host the files and you search for the files on the site. I'm going to just give a very quick uh, demonstration of how one might find some infringements. Uh, I'm going to use the Lancet because it's kind of a unique term. It's a journal from Elsevier. Um, a little disclaimer here. I don't know whether these are infringements. They may very well be because the Lancet is a you know, copyright publication. But there, there may be some instances where a journal's publisher will permit uh, free distribution, uh, as you know. So uh, this is really just to show you technically how uh, uh, some of these systems work. So ForShare um, has become a very popular hosting site for finding book infringements and, um, and other infringements such as the journal's materials. So here I'm on ForShare. Here's my search box. And I enter the search term, The Lancet. And here is a list of search results. Um, if I click on this one, you'll see it's, it's a PDF document of a, a Lancet uh, oncology uh, issue. And I click on that. Okay. And then I, it says download now. So I'll click on that button. And now you'll see they're trying to sell me a premium subscription. So in addition to having all of these advertisements, you'll see one here, they sell subscriptions where you can get faster downloads and, and other enhanced features. And uh, we know, or we've learned that RapidShare, another uh, hosting site, uh, has revenues of approximately 5 million euros per month based on selling subscriptions. So it's a, it's a big business. Um, so I'm clicking here to download the file without premium membership. Okay, and there you have what appears to be an entire journal in a, a, a very uh, easy to read and attractive looking PDF. Okay, um, and another way that you can find infringements often pretty easily is just do a Google search where you type rapid share and then whatever you're looking for. Um, so here's Lots of results. Now, rapid share links turn up all over the web. You see these are all different sites. And if I click on this, I'm taking, I'm taking files to, um, and then this one, interestingly, when you click on the link and you go to download the file, Fortunately, you get this, which appears to show that uh, perhaps Elsevier um, sent a takedown notice and the rapid share complied uh, with the takedown notice. The problem, though, is even though some of these sites comply with takedown notices, the new infringements uh, do uh, tend to come up uh, pretty quickly. So it's, it's a you know, constant game of sweeping away infringements. Okay, so back to the slides, um, and I'll try to move rather quickly since I'm getting a little tight on time. Um, 
Alicia is going to talk about the copyright infringement portal. This is a great way to generate takedown notices efficiently. Uh, we've made an arrangement for our members to use the service at uh, discounted rates, and uh, AAUP has a similar arrangement. In addition to takedown efforts, uh, AAP is uh, advocating for file posting and other file sharing sites to implement best practices to stop the uploads from going onto the sites in the first place. Uh, and this would include using technical filters to block infringing uploads, uh, sending warnings to infringing users, and eventually terminating repeat infringers, and doing a host of other things to um, to convert the sites into uh, services used for uh, primarily legal non-infringing purposes. Um, also, we have reached out to uh, the higher ed community, or, or we're working on outreach with AAUP uh, to uh, help them implement some provisions uh, in the 2008 Higher Education Reauthorization Act. Um, basically, right now we're talking to EDUCAUSE, a nonprofit organization which promotes IT for higher ed, to uh, provide them with some resources that, that they uh, have offered to post on their site, including uh, where students can get access to legal versions of uh, publishers' materials, and also raising awareness about how many industries a student may want to enter into after uh, their uh, college or, or, uh, or graduate studies uh, depend on intellectual property protection uh, for the industry to survive. And uh, there's my contact information, and I'll be happy to take questions at the appropriate time. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, I, uh, I I do have a, a, a question um, coming through here. Uh, the question is, is there a particular source of content uh, when you're looking at the patterns um, that you were describing? Is there a particular type of content that uh, is particularly vulnerable to this kind of uh, activity? Well, there are some variations in the volumes, but we're finding that all categories are being affected. So everything from trade novels to journals to uh, college textbooks to um, trade um, professional materials, it, it really runs the gamut. Um, it does seem that um, technical, uh, medical, textbook materials are all seem pretty high volumes, but but we're really seeing this type of piracy across all, all types of published works. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not seeing any other particular questions coming through at this point, so I'm now going to uh, hand over to Alicia Wise, and um, what you're about to see is uh, Alicia starting to uh, go through the actions of sharing her desktop. Um, so there we go. And we keep popping up. So, Alicia, um, uh, can I hand over to you now? Hopefully, have I unmuted successfully, John? You have. have. You have uh, <laughs> loud and clear. Right, I'll try not to sound quite so loud. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about a service developed in the UK publishing community by the Publishing Association uh, to help publishers work together to take some of the pain of the sending people notices to remove infringing content from the web. It's called the Copyright Infringement Portal. I have a little uh, demo here that will present an overview about how infringement can be registered when the take down notice is issued. Don't worry too much about the screenshots in your fall. We'll actually go into the live portal for the end of the presentation and go through much more to the screen views at that time. Really, the point here is to give you an idea of how, how it works and um, the method to issue take notices. So the portal is available online, and it is just users receive a new password to access it. The portal currently does not detect infringement for publishers, um, but that functionality will be added later in 2010. At the minute, it only issues takedown notices for infringements that have already been discovered by the publisher. So, for example, and this is an example that has worked throughout, um, a copy of Harry Potter's book, Guard Spies, that has been discovered online. Okay. 
the portal requires information only about the URL where the intention content is located. I can have the ability to add additional information as in you know, the title, but only the URL is required. Um, one of the nice features is that the portal will use automatic techniques to determine which is the correct internet service provider, um, because that is where we issue the ticket languages. And it can also detect which country that internet service provider is based in. And we have a, a library of different legal notices tailored to different legal jurisdictions around the world. And so your infringement is matched with the correct internet service provider and the correct legal wording and the deep standards of the Alisa, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, we've had a couple of people saying the line is quite crackly. There may be nothing we can do about this, but uh, maybe if you speak a little bit further away from this, let's try that. Okay. Um, I thought that the transatlantic line is too bad, but I will try to speak a bit more slowly and clearly as well. Thank you very much. Okay. Through the portal, it is not the Publishers Association issuing a take down on it. It's actually the right holder to publish on those instances. So we actually display a copy of the legal notice that has been generated and sent, and we ask um, users to click two boxes to confirm that they've verified the notice and that it is actually an infringing copy of material that they hold the rights in before the notice is sent. And throughout the portal, and you'll see this later in the live demo, there is a traffic light system unit. Right, so you can see the status of your notice, and you can see quite quickly whether or not the material that you have issued a take down notice for has in fact been removed from the internet. Another nice feature, and this will be easy to show, is that your notices are visible to all other publishers. So, in fact, the portal is becoming a nice discovery tool where you can see locations on the internet where other publishers are discovering essential content, and then you can draw those insights from your own materials if that's of concern to you. And at any time, you can look at other notices and review the status of your takedowns. There's a traffic light system used. The green bars show that everything is in hand, the notice has been sent, the child's been taken down. A yellow or amber bar means that some sort of user action is still required to issue the take down notices. And red bars indicate that an administrator action is necessary. The other interesting thing is that we capture a screenshot of the infringement when the take down notice is issued. And that is preserved, so it's a kind of evidence that can be called on if legal action against the intent of the community is going to be required. And there are various ways to accommodate more complex situations that are going to be going to be today. So I'll turn back to the slide. Before you, you see the copyright or the URL for the portal, and you can see the list of um, that are used to sell subscriptions. This is the single user subscription. But we are keen to work in partnership with other trade associations. The point of the portal is to really help our publishers tackle copyright infringement. And very importantly, to enable us at industry level to get a helicopter overview, a strategic overview of the nature and scale and pattern of copyright infringement. It's very important to us that it's not only the UK publishing community that is using it, but that we can work in partnership with other associations abroad. So AAP and AAP are both working in partnership with us and are able to offer 50% discounts to the members. And those prices are the same. Each of those associations has a standard case in the world, and so this is what the AAP interface is. This is one to the AAP. Okay, the statistics. These uh, we receive on a daily basis. We have very close monitoring of how the portal is being used. This statistical report was generated on Monday, the week on the 18th. And so far, the portal has been used to issue 2,680 notices, but each notice can include information about multiple infringing URLs. That covers at least 6,500 infringements. 
and we can also monitor what our success rate is. So right now we're getting about 61 percent of states taken down as a result of native descent by the portal. But there's quite a lot of variation in the responsiveness of different um, websites and internet service providers. So Script, which is a hosting site based in California, is very, very compliant in fact. They receive the most notices to the portal, but they are almost completely compliant. And often we're seeing them respond to take down notices in less than 24 hours, which is terrific. Rapid share, which has already been highlighted by Ed, is not a good citizen. And here you see that they're the second most um, common receiver of take down notices, but their compliance rate is only about 33%. And interestingly, I've been in conversation with them recently. They're claiming that our tech notices are being um, diverted by their filters. And um, since this problem was brought to their intense attention, it's amazing their compliance rates have actually decreased. So they do seem to be um, um, quite a bit of um, this popular thing, which is quite interesting. I'll very quickly go to the live service so you can see the portal in action. And I'm logged in as, as an administrator, so you'll see slightly more um, detail than uh, a user would. There were just a few um, points that I wanted to draw to your attention. First off, uh, just the companies that are using the portal at the minute, we do have 58 publishers who are now regular users. And they're coming from um, largely North America, the UK, and the Netherlands at this point. The publishers are large and small, for profit and not for profit. The other thing that I wanted to draw to your attention was this um, resource bank, where users can see the notices that are being generated by the publishers, which means that it is a very good discovery tool by finding the locations of other changes. That's a couple of other features. If you hover over a link, this is where you can actually see the captured snapshot of what the infringement looks like at the time the takedown of the is issued. This one is being a bit stuck on display, but it will come off. Now that's, now that's thinking. I'm going to skip that actually. I'll draw your attention here to the status bars. The green bars show that the user has in, entered all of the um, correct information. And you can see from the date here, these are all um, information that have actually been added by publishers today. And the dread bar, that unfortunately means that the information is still online and available to be seen. Um, that's probably not a surprise, as these people have been issuing this day. If you start scrolling down a little bit deeper into the portal, you can see that this infringement has been removed from the way that was issued yesterday. Just to get a very, very quick, very, very responsive. Again, this infringement has disappeared from the web, and that was issued yesterday as well. Going back up to the top, just a couple of other features to highlight. There's a bulk upload tool. One of the points of feedback we had from publishers using the portal, but it's very intuitive, but this portal doesn't necessarily fit neatly into everyone's workflow. And so what we've done is to develop a structured Excel spreadsheet, which you could keep on your desktop, actually pop URLs into that spreadsheet when you detect infringement online, and then the spreadsheet can be uploaded. It's being used now by two publishers, and they're literally uploading information to populate hundreds of notices at one time, maybe about once a week, or, or however it fits them in their workflow. In terms of getting started, there are various kinds of support materials to help users. Um, for example, we have various um, web based tutorials, and this won't be as exciting for you all because you can't hear the sound, but I'll just give you a, a slight clip of this. Um, there's a lovely, calming, soothing male editor, much like our moderators, and touch some of the 
very gently to the process of the vessel. It's happening in one area here, but you cannot be able to take your hands, fortunately. And it's a part of the moment, it's a little bit of a moment. I think you use your statement as to how to answer an opportunity and how to use it for it. And I've been trying to see this from that as well. Okay, so there's a certain type of having a device. It's quite interesting. We, um, we have had some advice that we would need to translate our paper notices into uh, the Chinese language and that we might have to tailor the legal wording for different jurisdictions. But as an experiment, what we have been doing is issuing 
in um, uh, uh, English language text analysis that are uh, in the next point. So actually, word is uh, in keeping with American law. And we had almost 100% responses um, to questions from the Chinese ISP that we have to be to that's terrific. Um, offline, where there are um, uh, cases where there are unresponsive services providers, uh, the PA and the AAP work together and have um, a very constant privacy program and including uh, litigation underway in China. Uh, that's not my um, personal area of responsibility. I'm not familiar with that. That, that might be more so. I think China may be one area we'll come back to in the general discussion, but I think we'd better to move on now. Thank you very much, Alicia, and I'm uh, going to remove your power to share. So um, uh, we're going back to the main slide now. So thank you, Alicia. And uh, we're now going to uh, pass control uh, over to um, Daphne Ireland. So, Daphne, I'm just making you the presenter now. Um, and I see your slide uh, coming up here. Um, so, uh, Daphne, if uh, you would like to make your presentation. Great. Well, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining this webinar. Um, my name is Daphne Ireland. I am the Director of Intellectual Property at Princeton University Press. Thank you also to the SSP and the AAUT for inviting me to share my thoughts and the trials for your fabulous leadership. Um, can you hear me all right? Very well. You're very clear. Good. Uh, so I prepared comments on how to combat digital piracy on a budget, but I should say I don't have singular answers, but what I can do is share aspects of our experience and give you some food for thought. First, I'd like to add a quick word about the press and our mission, which is probably a parallel to our audience mission, um, but I believe it is important to highlight our unique mission as we discuss piracy. Uh, we at Princeton are a not-for-profit publisher of academic work for students and scholars and the society at large. Our fundamental mission is to select for publication the most innovative works by the greatest minds in academia and disseminate that scholarship through print and digital media. The press consciously acquires a collection of titles, a coherent list of books, in each discipline that we publish, uh, providing focus, continuity, and the basis for the development of future scholarship. We ardently adhere to this mission, and we have defined our brand as an imprimatur of excellence for our author's work and their intellectual leadership. We believe that our mission and our imprimatur only become more valuable as the digital commons, the internet, becomes more cluttered, cluttered with quality publications and viable research alongside have fake musings and even deliberately false information posted by anyone on Earth that has Internet access. Our mission and our imprint become more valuable. Today we are discussing the problem of individuals posting unauthorized files online, or as some say, digital piracy. Referring to our mission, these unauthorized files pose a dilution of imprint and quality of publication and certainly a dilution of revenue. When readers stop exchanging money for owning, reading, and using our books, we lose revenue, our authors lose income, the publishing mechanism loses not only an incentive to publish new work, but also loses the very economic ability to publish new work. So let me emphasize here that university presses are not for profit and operate on a cost recovery basis. Uh, if one can imagine the hit that university presses, the authors, and our staff have taken simply in the economic, economic condition that is our great recession, and then add on top of it the problem of access to unauthorized files online. Dilution of imprint, dilution of quality, dilution of revenue. What is the extent of the problem? Uh, I think Ted has spoken to this very effectively in his presentation. Um, and pointing to some very useful statistics that were released last week in that report by a contributor. Here's a link to it. Uh, just to echo some of the statistics, um, within their sampling, there were 9 million downloads in the last three months of 2009, and as Ed said, that was across 913 popular titles. So, PUP statistics 
are comparably a drop in the bucket. Um, but since July 2008, when we uh, became aware of our problem, um, we've taken down over 500 files, which were across 210 titles. Now, when you compare, and this is the first time I'm doing it, when you compare our 210 titles to the 913, I mean, that's a significant portion. Um, but you'll see that some of those titles had multiple files listed. To add some context, uh, the press has a backlist of about 10,000 titles, and nowadays we're publishing about 200 new titles a year. Uh, so those 210 unauthorized title, titles are a larger drop in the bucket, um, and we're certain that there's more. Uh, yet somehow we hope we've already hit the iceberg and that it's not just the tip. What have we discovered is the source of unauthorized files? Uh, we have done what we can, underscore, to identify the source, uh, which in our case has turned out to be multiple sources of unauthorized files. And to give you a very general idea, and we've thrown caution to the wind and are venturing some completely non-scientific uh, estimates on distribution here, um, we estimate that about 10% are scanned from a printed book, either from a library or an individual's copy. Uh, perhaps about 40% of some third-party ebook vendors. And in those early days of discoveries, we found that a, we, we think that about 50% were pre-publication files, that is, files that were shared with the copy editor, the compositor, the author, or review files sent to foreign publishers for consideration for translation. The galley printer, the book printer, publicity outlets, desk copies for professor, professors, and the visually impaired. So I'd like to add here that since we estimate 50% of the unauthorized files post pre publication files, there's a direct jeopardy also to the quality and the integrity of the publication and the version of record. Needless to say, we have since made efforts to and have succeeded in many ways to tighten distribution and reduce the incidence of pre-publication files leaking out. But we continue uh, to work with people centers. How do we detect unauthorized files? Our primary mode of detection is our authors. I was called into the high seas in uh, July of 2008. I remember I just turned, uh, returned from a glorious vacation in the northwest of Maine. I had unplugged, the cable didn't reach, the wireless was patchy at best. But when I returned to the office, I was greeted by over a dozen complaints from our authors. I guess no longer a chain to their lectern. Uh, they dove into their writing project. Googling research and perhaps their own names. And in the digital commons, they discovered unauthorized online editions of the works that they spent the previous summer vacation laboring over. So knowing that we had a responsibility to protect our author's interests, but not knowing quite how to proceed, I called my colleagues at other university presses, at textbook publishers, and Ed McCoy. And with their aggregated experience and advice, we started on our journey. Other than authors, uh, occasionally TUP does receive tips from TUP readers and sympathizers who find something online and alert us to the pirated file. And finally, we do search and take down routine ourselves, um, which I describe a couple of slides further down the line. How do we engage with unauthorized files? Perhaps the most important thing for small presses to note, if you're thinking about doing this, is that these sites are the wild west. And before venturing, uh, you may want to be sure that your computers are protected by up to the minute virus protection. Um, the files in many cases carry viruses that may affect and cripple, in fact, and cripple your computer. Um, and in a separate category altogether are the torrent sites. And these are probably the most tricky to explore. Uh, book content is certainly not the only material posted, and so one might think twice before sending in the young and innocent intern as a scout. Um, while TUP decided initially to handle the search and take down in-house, there are monitoring services available to search your publisher's titles, as Ed and uh, Alicia have mentioned. Uh, one such is a tributor, which offers automated and, quote, automated enforcement solutions, and, um, and is the author of that report that Ed referenced earlier. Uh, some others that I've heard about are Audible Magic, Integrity, Mexicon. Uh, I'm sure that there are at least a handful more. But in the following slides, I give a basic step 
tour of a case study using our search and take down routine. Ed did a great job doing a live one, so I think I might just um, pass through rather quickly on that. But I'd like to thank my colleague, Mike Schwartz, our intellectual property assistant, who is responsible for the hands-on search and takedown and um, helping me develop this routine. So to fold in the title of our session, How to Combat Piracy on a Budget, here is our do-it-yourself routine. First, one needs to search and find the material. You go to an index site. As Ed was explaining, an index site indexes various links to the file. In this case, uh, we searched Adax Home. And one will probably need, as you enter these sites, you will probably need to register or log on, uh, create a login. And uh, for this purpose, we created a Hotmail email account um, just to preserve some distance uh, from the site. Then one searches for the material. Uh, the most effective search terms that we found are the publisher name and or the ISBN prefix. Uh, very effective. And in fact, most of the bibliographic data um, will appear with, with all of the pirated in books, including catalog, copy, and jacket covers. Uh, you will find your book listed, and you may save the screenshot like this one to a hard drive, which is what we do. Uh, and then one, one clicks through the book link to locate the book page. You see the blue there is the book link. Click through it, you get to the book page. This lists multiple file links at the bottom in the red uh, to a host site. The host site is where users upload the unauthorized files and the site holds or hosts them for users to link on the index site. Some links will be to a unique host site and some will be to will be different articulations of the same host file uh, for a mirror site. But if you click on one of these red links at the bottom, you've located the host site, which in this case is RapidShare, the number one host site listed in the attributor report um, that Ed mentioned and also that Alicia has statistics on. Um, and we, too, have found that most of our files are housed on RapidShare. This is your last chance to be sure that your computer is up to date virus protection and that you are proceeding with your IT selection. You click through the prompt, and the book will download. We find that books usually download as .rar files, or files, uh, which, we, which need to be unstuffed. So we right-click, we follow the prompt, we extract the file. The folder appears, and it contains the PDF version of the book. We save them on a hard drive. Finally, one sends a takedown notice to the host site, not the index site. Some host sites provide an interactive form on their site and may require that the takedown be sent through that page. Uh, we simply copy and paste our takedown form letter into that field that they provide. Um, our takedown letter, which I've truncated here in the screenshot for space purposes, was drafted by our attorney. It is DMCA compliant. And the real template includes a statement about our not-for-profit status and our mission in scholarly publication. Some sites send a response email uh, confirming that the file has been disabled. Some sites do not, but we routinely go back and check. We have been logging our findings in a spreadsheet. You can't see all the fields in the screenshot, but they start off screen to the left with the basic author, title, ISBN. You will see with the left most visible column that we log other vital traits of our book, such as pub date and price. Uh, we wanted very much to try to pattern uh, whether the cases of, of piracy were recent publications, were they backlist, were they only high-priced books, uh, et cetera. And, you know, there is a pattern. Uh, it's everything, it seems. Next columns to the right, we log the index site, the URL, the host site, and the host site URL. And then finally, off the screen to the right, we record whether we contacted them and whether the files were taken down. In the summer of 2008, when we were first faced with our author's reports of unauthorized files and were called to action, we hired an intern who worked full-time over the course of several months doing reactive and proactive search and takedown and documenting this routine. Uh, we have since been forced to reduce our activity due to strains on resources. Um, additionally, we have a new account with the recently created Publishers Association Copyright Infringement Portal that Alicia described. Um, and I'm just repeating a little bit here, but publishers pay a subscription fee. They do go 
your own search and download, and then go to the portal and log in, authorize file, URL, etc. And while there's still work required on the part of the publisher at this time to detect and use some data entry, I think the benefit of the portal is that it automatically reports the piracy incident, including the host site, and automatically generates and sends the takedown notice here for the copyright law of that country where the infringing site is located. And as Alicia mentioned, in the future, it will be providing monitoring and protection services, which I think is really huge. Sorry, here's the website which you already know. So that concludes reacting to non-authorized files, uh, but how do we prevent unauthorized files from being posted online? And not surprisingly, we devote a fair amount of attention to this. First, um, we confirm the security of all of our FTP sites. We tighten procedures for locking and indeed watermarking all of our PDF files. All files carry a standard copyright notice saying what the user may or may not do with the file. Like many publishers, our files also contain a unique identifier so that we may know which files have gone to which party, whether for foreign rights review or to a copy editor, to a printer, to an ebook vendor. And then if those files end up online, we know the source without a doubt. Beyond tightening the security, we have also had to suspend some courtesies until we have some more secure distribution. We use to distribute PDFs for publicity review and desk copies for professors adopting the book. But the ease and convenience of that digital distribution in these areas has not outweighed the risk. Um, please understand that we do still provide publicity review copies and desk copies of books, but we have resorted to the old print copy. We have an agreement with a major digital distributor uh, that one day soon will be solely responsible for the secure transfer of all of our digital files, no matter the destination the copy editor, the desk copy, the foreign publisher, et cetera. And I believe some presses use free online file sharing sites, um, like MediaFire, um, which may be a good solution, but I'm not sure whether those sites themselves might be a board or even a target of pirates. Uh, but I, I toss it out there for discussion. Um, some presses use digital distributors, digital distribution, all right, digital distribution services like Code Mantra, Ingram, BiblioVault, and others um, in the industry. We have begun to, become, to be more careful and interview and audit the security measures of our publishing partners, our printers, our ebook vendors, and licensees. And for recent par partners, like ebook vendors, there is a clause in each contract that addresses the need for current security standards. Similarly, in our other licenses, for example, um, a foreign publisher, um, we have included a, a clause that says that they guarantee that they will protect any files that we may provide for them for their translation and production purposes. And finally, our digital publications carry standard DRM settings with the options uh, such as audio, copy, paste, print, download, variously enabled or disabled depending on the product, the device, and the audience. What strategic changes can we make to further prevent piracy? Um, we have made our editors aware of the issue, and we are speaking with our authors about the phenomenon. Like our publishers, we have adopted more conservative policies on sharing our proprietary final book PDFs. We hope that by raising the awareness with authors and showing that even well-intentioned sharing of files may end up down the line in an unauthorized posting. As I said, in our experience, authors have been very concerned about this issue, and they are a primary driving force behind our activity. My final point is the most important prevention strategy that we are pursuing, and that is the digital marketplace. We want our author scholarship to be disseminated widely, and we are seeing enough commerce to support a continuing publication process, so we are earnestly expanding the number of titles we offer for distribution and sale in digital format at reasonable prices. Readers will not need to post or download unauthorized files if PC offers the book in a digital format at a reasonable price in the first place. The reader will have the work in a desired format at a reasonable price and can rely on the quality and integrity of the authoritative version. And PC can use those mission-driven and economic incentives to support its academic publishing program. On the subject of awareness, 
I'd like to put note a thought-provoking article from the New York Times. Uh, it is called The Madness of Crowd, an Internet Delusion by John Tierney, and it was published January 11, 2010. And I just quote a couple of passages quickly. It starts with, When does the wisdom of the crowd give way to the meanness of mobs? John Manier was one of the early proponents of the digital commons, but now, quote, he blames the web's tradition of drive-by anonymity for fostering vicious past behavior on blogs, forums, and social networks. He acknowledges the examples of generous collaboration, like Wikipedia, but argues that the mantras of open culture and information wants to be free have produced a destructive new social contract. Uh, I greatly admire independent thinkers, and especially those who, like apparently from this article, Lanier, have the courage to say that they were wrong and that it's not change. To wrap up, um, how can we make progress in stopping unauthorized posting of files? Well, a, a legitimate proposal has been to pursue an end of unauthorized posting by aggregating our efforts and considering litigation. Um, perhaps after the copyright infringement portal has collected financial data, trends may appear and next steps may become apparent. But my final thought is that authors are a partner. The digital commons is actually our partner in creating a digital marketplace where authors' works are widely accessible in legitimate digital form at reasonable prices. So let's engage our authors. Let's engage the digital commons and give them what they want, a digital marketplace. I thank you for your attention and your time. Thank you very much, Daphne. Uh, we have um, uh, maybe one or two questions specifically for you uh, before we open this up to general discussion. And um, there's a, a particular interest in, uh, you know, the options for doing this oneself as a small publisher. Uh, so you described, um, you described the, 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 the sort of the staffing or, or the very small amount of, um, uh, the sort of intern help that you had when initially doing this protection activity. Uh, going forward, uh, do you think you will have um, any dedicated staff for the press looking into this, or are you going to rely entirely on the copyright infringement portal? I have uh, one person assisting me, and I have instructed that individual to limit their attention to piracy to a number of hours a week. And so it is still a permanent part of our weekly routine, um, but it is largely reactive, a little bit proactive, um, and if we will certainly be using the, the copyright infringement portal, but, but at the moment, um, since we're still in the position of having to do our own detection, uh, that, that can be a lot of the, the time spent. Um, but I think that the benefit of the portal is that it's going to aggregate our information, sort of like we were doing in the beginning, uh, trying to see patterns and trends on our own. Well, you know, now we have an industry tool to do that. Um, so I, I see it still being a dedicated chunk of time, but an important, it's a, we have a responsibility for our authors to be doing this. And um, eventually when the portal or other services, um, we, we have not seriously considered other services to do the detection, but when, when there are inexpensive services that will detect and send take down notices and record the uh, incidents, I think that it will make our task a lot easier. So, uh, I mean, uh, go going forward, I mean, you would see uh, either a position or part of a position uh, being an appropriate uh, thing to, uh, to, to keep having at a publisher of your size. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, and there is a particular interest in, in, that, uh, in that position and um, whose position one might make it part of. Uh, the person who's assisting you, uh, what, what else do they do within the press? Uh, they are the permissions coordinator. They license um, uh, our permissions, and they uh, assist me in my endeavors, uh, the piracy, the copyright registration, uh, our accounting for permissions. I'm sure I'm missing a few of their tasks, but it's, it's a sort of rights assistant position. Thank you very much. So I'd like to invite uh, all the presenters back onto the call. Um, and uh, I'm going to uh, put up our main slide again uh, now, and uh, we're going to open up the uh, open up the discussion a bit. And um, 
Actually, one of the first questions that has come up um, is a, a very practical, uh, a very practical question, and um, that is about the uh, the takedown notice that you showed uh, briefly, Daphne, during your presentation. And um, the, uh, the the takedown notice has generated some interest, and uh, people wonder where they can find a similar example. Um, is it, just to ask you, Daphne, first of all, um, the version that you had the Princeton uh, attorney draft, is that something uh, that uh, you could or would potentially be willing to share, or is it very much you know, bespoke to an individual uh, university? Well, I answer that completely. That the lawyer that drafted this for us is a freelance lawyer. Her name is Heather Florence. Um, and uh, since we, as a university press, since University Press is separately incorporated from our university, I can do that. Um, but other university presses um, that are directly uh, the department of the university may have to go through your university council to um, get a template. But uh, if you want to start, I mean, and, and it might actually help to bring a template to the university council and say, can you start with this and make it something that you can approve. Um, and I, I could share ours. Um, but I would be afraid of people relying on it without, you know, counsel of their own. Um, I know that there are uh, also forms in the, the book by Roy Hoffman that I think many of us own, the publishing forms and contracts that contains a takedown template. Um, I think that if you Google uh, the, the terms, you could probably find a template to start. Um, you could also write into the UK Central Office. They might be able to put you in touch with someone. And then finally, uh, the Publishers Association website, you know, has its own takedown templates there. So if you are a, a, a member, you can do both. So there are, there are a handful of ideas of places that you could look for a template. Thank you very much. And there has been interest in um, seeing uh, the speakers' presentations uh, afterwards, uh, maybe having copies of those. And um, it, let's, uh, we will talk afterwards uh, about how much we will be able to share uh, with the registrants in general. So, um, so we certainly hope to be able to share um, something, and you'll see uh, you'll see a link to those materials that we have been able to share uh, when you uh, get the link to the recording. So we'll try and share as much as possible. And thank you for that um, that generous comment, uh, Daphne. Um, I wanted to open up a question uh, here, uh, perhaps particularly just um, uh, uh, aim it first with Alicia. Alicia, are you on the call? Yes, and then I unmute you. You, you sound loud and clear. You're still a bit crackly, but we haven't been able to deal with that, but um, you sound good. And there's a lot of interest in this uh, in the service uh, around the copyright infringement portal to do with protection. And um, uh, could you just uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about um, what you will be rolling out uh, when you have that service and what it will do? Unfortunately, I, I can't. I'm not receiving the first um, the, the alpha version of that tool until at the end of this month, and we'll be then. Testing with publishers uh, in February and April. It's due to be live in May. Uh, so, what uh, I can say is that when it first released, it will be a fairly cheap and cheerful tool. And if you're not quite sure yet, um, the number of titles it will be able to accommodate. But it will be able to scan um, all of the websites and internet service providers known to the portal. So we will be doing regular scans of the entire web, and we will um, begin an easy way to see how it goes up. So it will be some form of automated crawling. You're not going to have um, a bank of operatives uh, doing this by hand. Oh, goodness, no. It will have to be automated. And the idea is that the tool will um, automatically detect suspected infringement, populate the portal with those, and then publishers will need to come in and review to make sure that they are in any control that um, the content isn't licensed and, and legitimate. And it will take some, some time, I think, to refine this tool and to scale it up. So I'm trying to downplay the expectations about it when it's first launched, but we are very committed to, to, to investing in that endeavor, helping it over time. And 
Thank you very much. And the further question that may uh, initially be aimed particularly at Daphne, um, but please feel free to jump in with uh, your answers. Once the takedown notice is sent, what are the advised next steps if the infringer does not comply? Daphne, have you had this experience? Ah, uh, yes. Um, well, you can send it again, <laughs> and then you can hire a lawyer, which to date we have not done because on, on the point of resources, um, it's, you know, we, we simply cannot litigate everyone who has hired a file. I, I, um, I think this is why the, um, the efforts of the Publishers Association and the AAP um, in uh, marking trends and beginning conversations with some of the most egregious offenders um, is really, really what I pin my hopes on because uh, we couldn't possibly um, – to litigation on our own, but we might through, uh, the, you know, under the aegis of, of one of these industry groups. And uh, uh, a Prince University Press is, of course, uh, mainly a book publisher. Is a book publisher. Um, there is a question: uh, uh, Are there any suggestions for monitoring infringed journals that may be different than books? Um, so, Alicia or Ed, uh, would you like to address that one? Well, I would just say that all of the sites where we found large volumes of book infringements, if you look for journals, you'll find them very quickly. Um, so I think a lot of the, um, the techniques and the places you would look uh, would be the same. Uh, we have also learned of some sites uh, that have since been shut down, but where people were, uh, or, or the activity has been shut down on the site, where people were giving one another access to legitimate logins, so for example, for university systems to get access to a journal, uh, where, where an unscrupulous individual would, would uh, share the login information uh, with other people. Um, and in that case, uh, the publishers have had to go to the sites and point out what's going on. And uh, fortunately, in the two cases that I know of, the activity did cease. And that's interesting you mentioned that, because that was a specific question that's just come up, which is, um, uh, is, is there, uh, is there, are there many examples of people sharing uh, logins to uh, password restricted um, uh, electronic hosting sites, and how can those be discovered and uh, prevented? Um, is, 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 that sounds like a linked problem, Ed. Yeah, I mean, the way I found out about it was was by being alerted by some folks on our working group, and I and I let the rest of the group know there was an instance where. Somebody was using Squib.com to advertise uh, activities on one of these uh, third-party sites. And so Squib was, was willing to take down that link immediately, and then the, the publisher took up the matter directly with the site as well. And then, uh, is this something that the copyright infringement portal might, uh, uh, might be working on, too? Yes, you can um, issue takedown notices to um, web pages that are hosting passwords. Um, and to discover those, again, sometimes different people such as for a free password and then a, a journal title, or open password and a journal title, or the, the branded name of the publisher's um, hosting site. For example, whatever the high wire hosting password is called, you can search that in a special search for an open password. Ed, I mean, this, uh, this may be, um, I, I think I'm correct here, but uh, there's an interesting question here, which I think is a, a, a broader topic for discussion, and it feeds a little bit into uh, what uh, Daphne was saying at the end of her talk about the digital marketplace. And the question is, how can publishers balance need to protect against piracy with participating in wider revenue opportunities of the digital marketplace? And as uh, mentioned, you had particularly because I'm not correct in saying that some, uh, especially some of the big trade publishers, have really um, partnered with people like Squid. Didn't Simon & Schuster do that? Uh, yeah, Simon & Schuster and more recently uh, John Wiley & Sons, uh, as well as Barrett Kohler and some others, are actually selling e-books uh, via a content store on Squid's site. And um, then Random House and, and several others are uh, posting free promotional content, so maybe a free electronic chapter to promote the uh, sales of, of the full text of the work. And um, uh, publishers
publishers, you know, as, as I see it, uh, the publishers in our membership are really embracing opportunities. You'll see now that um, they're on the Amazon store alone, there are more than 300,000 uh, book titles available as Kindle editions, and then there's a whole host of other ebook platforms which publishers are embracing. And that's, I think uh, that's, uh, you know, doing that is a very good idea. And what sort of proportions uh, are people uh, who are, you know, legitimately partnering with Squid? What sort of proportions do you see them taking uh, to um, pre preventing things being reposted? Is there a lot of uh, watermarking or are there other techniques being used? Yeah. But primarily with Squid, and, and something that we're advocating uh, for in the best practices for sites generally, is to use uh, filters such as text matching, which is what Squid employs, where every time the publisher sends a takedown notice uh, for a particular title. Squid will make a copy of that title and put it into a database and then check uh, all future uploads content against the files in the database and where there's a match, it, it will uh, purport to uh, prohibit the upload. Now, we do believe that um, that should only be done with uh, the publisher's express permission. Um, but the concept um, uh, makes sense to us. And also, uh, some publishers are actually providing additional uh, files of text to um, enhance uh, the filter and, and to catch uh, more uh, attempted uh, uploads of infringements. And Daphne, I know you mentioned watermarking. There is some interest uh, uh, in the question uh, in further thoughts on that. Um, I, have, I have a question here, which is, um, how effective is watermarking with an IP address or other information that may ID the person or institution that downloaded the file? Is there any sense of, uh, is there any way of getting a sense of uh, how effective watermarking is? You found it quite um, uh, reticent about it. So we're doing it because we feel like it's, again, an obligation and a responsibility. Um, we include in the file a unique identifier so that if we know that that file, you know, we find a file on the on the web that we locate the identifier, we know that that was sent to this particular printer. We, we can call up that printer and say, what are you guys doing on your security end? You know, uh, do you have FTP sites that are not secure? Or if we've marked a file that... Um, was sent to a particular ebook vendor, we can call up that ebook vendor and say, look, in our contract, it says that you are going to maintain um, industry standard securities. What exactly do you have in place at this time? Have you upgraded them? Have you updated them? And, uh, you know, how did this file get out? Um, so it's just it's turning into uh, a bit more of a conversation starter and, and putting um, our partners, our, our publishing partners down the line um, on notice that they have as much a responsibility as we do to keep these things um, as safe as possible. One of the other things you noticed, Elizabeth, at the end of your talk was this issue of author awareness, and that being one of the very best uh, tools for detecting but also combating this practice. And, uh, Alison, are you on the call? Yes, hi, Carol, I'm here. I'm, I'm very interested uh, to hear if there's a particular library's perspective on this issue, because, of course, libraries are already doing a lot in terms of uh, educating uh, uh, people on campus, faculty and students, about other ethical issues. Mm -hmm. um, Alison, would you like to comment uh, on, on that? Yes, yeah, I mean, I, I was going to say, I certainly I hope that the, the speakers know that libraries are very sympathetic to this issue and have sort of pretty good understanding, you know, about the amount of work and effort that goes into creating these scholarly works and we're also, as Charles said, definitely on the front lines when it comes to, you know, at the point at which people are using information and where they're getting their information from. So I think that we, we're in a pretty unique position to kind of help educate and kind of build this awareness around, you know, what kind of information you're using and also how you are sharing it, how you are disseminating it and distributing it. And, I know um, from my position as a copyright librarian that there are quite a few libraries across the country who are developing these free courses on copyright and, and, you know, what it is and what kind of use policies are, are active on the campus and what people can do and what they can't do. So I would say that there's pretty, you know, ripe opportunity to partner with libraries to kind of get this 
word out to people that especially are on campuses. And I must say, being on a, a university campus here at Purdue, I, I uh, heard a presentation from the provost yesterday um, in which he said a related thing, which is that university administrations are now seriously concerned by issues of plagiarism and uh, incorrect crediting. I, I realize that's a tangential issue, but that uh, this is so badly affecting academic careers that they're taking it extremely seriously. And of course, plagiarism can be protected through some of these automated tools. Mm -hmm. um, Ed, uh, uh, you mentioned EDUCORS. Is, is, um, is the uh, uh, Association of American Publishers also working with some uh, library groups, other library groups? Yeah, part of our effort includes uh, reaching out to the Association of Research Libraries, for example, um, and that, um, that overture is, is being made by one of uh, the uh, university press members of uh, a task force that we formed. And EDUCARS was, was kind of the first step, but we ended up uh, approaching them initially because they gave a webinar on these provisions in the Higher Ed Act. And um, since, since we saw that, that they were creating some, some web uh, tools and resources, we, um, we went to them first. But we were very interested in working with the library community um, and uh, to partner on this in any way that uh, we can help. And I know that uh, there are a number of services being used to detect uh, plagiarism, a number of commercial services that universities are using to detect plagiarism. Um, uh, and this year particularly, uh, you know, are there um, other services apart from the copyright infringement portal? I mean, are, are, there, um, are there competitors, as it were, or, or are there other things that you're seeing, um, seeing publishers using uh, to do similar functions. I know it's an unfair question, but... Uh, well, let me explain. It, 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 in terms of plagiarism detection, Crosstrack has a terrific service, again, a shared industry service that can help um, detect um, plagiarism. Um, so I strongly encourage you to look at that. In terms of the competition for the portal, um, in, in one way, in terms of being an open, visible, and downloaded service, I'm not aware of any similar services. But it's very complementary to that reason to learn of the commercial detection and take down services like a tributary and capitalism and services that's been mentioned in the course of the call. And that can be some of their complementary um, activities. And what, sorry, go ahead, please. And, um, I think this is the wrong time in the conversation. It would be interesting to think about um, the cost confusion at some point, charging when you feel it might be appropriate. Yes, let's move on to that. Um, could you expand on that? Uh, how computing, uh, could you just, uh, first of all, just uh, the, the, the science a little bit? Sure thing. Um, at, at the moment, urgently, a lot of our piracy problem comes because um, our readers and intermediaries are accustomed to downloading and retaining copies of their um, reading material. Uh, we had tools for photocopiers um, in the past. Now we have hard drive tools, copies of PDF tools or other material. In, in the future, um, the way technology is going is that it is possible to have very secure hosting of content um, that's described as a cloud. And rather than downloading new copies, readers or users simply access their own, own little space in that cloud. They have their own little reading shelf, which might contain content that they acquire access to from a wide variety of uh, publishers or content service providers. And if we could shift to a cloud computing model and help readers and users to feel comfortable accessing the tool that way rather than needing to download and keep a copy, it, it's quite likely um, that we could see a decrease in the piracy and it could get away from um, the environmental content and other, other things that they're sort of criticized for because they can actually get to it. That's a very interesting question. Uh, it does raise some issues uh, for librarians, I suspect, around uh, privacy, uh, um, Alison, would you say? Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a little unaware of cloud computing, but so you can see, you can see what other people are reading and what other people have on their shelves. Not at all. In fact, um, uh, the Google Gmail service, 
It's an example of a cloud computing service. Rather than any different company hosting their own email servers in their own email repositories locally on the machines in their um, headquarters, it's all stored on machines at Google. But uh, if you trust uh, that service provider, then you trust them to be providing you a secure and private part of the cloud. So that your transactions and interactions shouldn't be visible um, to anyone else. Mm -hmm. But the content is secure. It resides elsewhere. You're only having a glimpse and not downloading a copy to secure that type of thing. Um, Ed, it's, uh, it's interesting. I mean, once one starts to explore areas of privacy and, 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 and that sort of area, I mean, what are you seeing on the horizon in terms of uh, relevant uh, uh, legal activity around this whole area of piracy? I mean, what should we be watching out for in the next year or so uh, in terms of legislation? Okay, well, uh, the most significant legislative activity we've seen in this area as of late has been abroad. Uh, so, for example, in France and in Taiwan, uh, the governments have uh, instituted uh, what are known as three strikes laws, uh, where uh, due process is provided, uh, uh, for example, in, uh, under the, the uh, new law in France, um, a, a court would have to step in uh, to authorize this. But at some stage, if a, if a user of, of an Internet access service uh, it's found to be um, engaging in infringement of copyrighted works and not uh, complying with uh, takedown uh, warnings. Uh, then actually that, uh, that person's service can be uh, suspended. Um, and it's a very serious issue because, for example, in France, uh, Internet access is seen as a fundamental human right. Uh, but eventually the, uh, the law was passed uh, and, and upheld uh, under constitutional scrutiny on the basis that a court um, would have to review that, uh, that ultimate step of uh, actually suspending somebody's service uh, due to repeat infringement. And uh, there are uh, comparable legislative efforts uh, underway in other places, including Spain, uh, possibly something in the United Kingdom, and in several other uh, countries. Um, also, on the litigation front, um, we are seeing more and more decisions coming down in favor uh, of copyright industries in, um, in the United States, for one. Uh, so, most recently, uh, the operator of several foreign sites, including ISOHUNT, uh, was found liable under a theory uh, established by the U.S. Supreme Court known as inducement, where if your uh, actions and or statements show that you're distributing a, um, a copying technology for the purpose of promoting its use for infringement, uh, you can be found, or you can be held liable for the resulting acts of infringement. So um, uh, this uh, recent decision came down from the uh, Central uh, Federal District Court in California, uh, and the same court also uh, instituted a $110 million judgment against the uh, torrent site Torrent Spy back in 2008. Um, and there have been other uh, decisions uh, applying, uh, applying the inducement theory uh, against um, uh, services, uh, including the, the Usenet decision uh, against uh, the Usenet uh, provider of, of uh, message boards um, and others. And then in, in Germany, the music industry has brought upwards of 20 successful proceedings against rapid share uh, for uh, uh, infringements of songs reappearing on rapid share following a takedown. So uh, very interesting uh, litigation activity abroad as well. Thank you very much for that summary. Um, so we're drawing close to the end of the call, um, but I'd like to ask uh, any of the speakers if, um, if you have a burning question or, or a topic that you don't feel has been uh, covered. I mean, clearly this is a very large area and we're only able to scrape the surface, but is there anything particular any of the uh, speakers would like to bring up? One kind of thing. Here um, in the UK, um, our parliament is debating on three strikes law, and the first thing we're getting is just decline. But in parallel to that, we are beginning to build up some case law as rights holders seek um, uh, pilot support. Uh, and the pattern that we're seeing are very um, 
different outcomes in different trials where there's a very similar evidence base. And the reason for this seems to be that when juries consider um, piracy cases, um, they are often very inclined to accept the defense that the person didn't know what they were doing was wrong. And I think that really points to the underpinning need to really, um, for all rights holders, to promote copyright, copyright awareness, um, and why it's helpful to create an anti industry to protect copyright. And to, to, to get that word out, why is it? Should we think that he would like to look for the claim that he didn't know what he was doing? And I think that's an excellent way of ending the talk, this emphasis on education and uh, working with authors. And in general, uh, the emphasis on partnership seems to be a central message that we're getting out of this. Um, Alicia, we've had a real, um, uh, I mean, a lot of questions and a lot of uh, interest in, um, in your service, in the copyright infringement portal. Um, Certainly a lot of suggestions about partnership. I mean, High Wire Press came up, also SFP, and, uh, and uh, the hope that um, you know, some of these uh, special rates to bring uh, the costs of the portal within the reach of uh, smaller publishers, uh, some of these alliance arrangements would be extended. Um, so uh, I, I, I think there's a lot of interest there, and hopefully some good conversations to be followed up on. Um, also, uh, somebody else uh, on the call is uh, Kirsty Neddings, who's the um, product manager for CrossCheck. And uh, one of the things we will do after the call is we'll share some uh, some other um, sort of uh, you know contact details and and ideas about other services that are similar or um, slightly similar or, or uh, work in the same area. Um, I do apologize to everybody for the crackery line, but uh, it seems that it wasn't just Alicia's line. Uh, we also had some other crackery lines. I hope that didn't uh, disrupt your uh, enjoyment and learning experience. Uh, just to remind you, you will be receiving a survey um, online, and we would be very grateful if you completed it. And uh, soon afterwards, you will be receiving a link to the recording, and you'll also be receiving a link there to the resources that we have uh, been able to share um, uh, that the speakers have provided. So I think all it remains for me to do is to uh, thank the speakers very much indeed for their presentations on behalf of SSB and AUP. Um, I'm going to ask the speakers, uh, once everybody else logs off, please could you remain on the line, um, that uh, thank you all for attending this uh, first SSB AUP web seminar of the year, and uh, thank you for your questions, and good luck with your detection and prevention. Thank you very much. We're Thank now you. ending. The